In uh, the session on sexism and the spirit of Baal, we began to see something of God's heart. He is a servant leader. He is the husband, the self-sacrificing leader. And in this session, we want to look at specifically the humility of God. Because it is in God's nature and character to be a servant. We saw this in the book of Hosea. And we will see this as we study this material. But God's nature of servant leadership is archetypal. It's to be how we conceive of leadership. And in most of our cultures, we think of leadership as power. And in some, it's not just power, it's tyrannical power, where you rule with a sword or with a whip, whether it's your household or the government. That's what we think of when we think of leadership. And that is not archetypal leadership for those who are followers of Christ. I want to begin by looking at a couple of dirty words. Serve and submit. These are dirty words in the modern world. We don't like those words. Just getting to a point where I now realize that I have to go back to God's original plan, not just for me, but for my country, because this is the reality in Kenya today. A lot of women want to have children, but don't want husbands because they, want, they don't want to submit to authority. Submission is looked at as a really bad word. It's, it's looked at as oppression. You know, women want their rights. Women want to, to, to rule, to be independent in a sense. Modern secularism and feminism look at subordination and equality as contradictions. To be under authority is by definition to be inferior. And to be equal means to be autonomous. No one's going to tell me what to do. This is modern culture. To obey God or any human authority is to restrict freedom. And this is bad because we have a broken concept of freedom. We think of freedom as being able to do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it. That's not freedom, that's license. And we need to make a distinction between license and freedom. So modern secularists and postmodern people and feminists of both the modern and postmodern type, they want license, not freedom. Because freedom requires uh, structure and boundaries. Freedom without restraint is the modern concept of virtue, but freedom without restraint ends up in slavery. What is the context in which leadership is defined? Sexist culture sees leadership in terms of tyranny. And too often the rejection of authoritarianism is a rejection of all authority. We reject authoritarianism, and we should, but that doesn't mean we should reject authority. And leadership is to be defined within the context of God's nature and character, 
not the culture's concept. Authority exists for building up, for edifying, not for tearing down. And there's a relationship between form and freedom. Tyranny is form without freedom. Anarchy is freedom without form. So to be really free, we need to live within the framework of God's laws and ordinances. This is where we find true freedom. True freedom is within form, and the biblical balance establishes that we are most free when we live within the framework of God's laws and ordinances. We see this in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We are most free when we govern ourselves, when we internalize government. Government isn't out there, government is in here. When we govern ourselves based on God's laws and ordinances, obeying all that I have commanded, we are most free. When we rebel against God's laws and ordinances, we end up impoverished and enslaved. So we want to look at the Trinity, and we see God's nature stands as a challenge to modern man's arrogance. God's nature stands in contrast to modern man's arrogance. Modern man sees service and self-sacrifice and humility as vices. These are bad things. Power and self-fulfillment and pride are virtues. We are more interested in self than we are in others. God honors humility and self-sacrifice and subordination in man. These are virtues that are reflection of the nature of the love of God. They're not apart, they're not separate, but they are founded in God's very nature. We find these words, and these are radical words in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why was Jesus glorified by God? Because he humbled himself. Though he was God, he was a servant. And Paul is saying, have this mind in you. Have this mind in you, which was in the mind of Christ. This is Christ's mind, 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Agape love is humble. It's self-sacrificing. It's selfless. It thinks of others first. It serves others first. And so much of the life of Christendom today, you hear the message, oh, you're a son of God. God wants you to be comfortable. He wants to lavish all sorts of things on you. That's what we hear over and over again. But Christ came to what? To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is agape love. My friend and affiliate co-founder of the Disciple Nations Alliance is Dr. Bob Moffat, and he has said, shared so much on this theme. This theme could not have been developed without Bob Moffat and his heartbeat. He said this, it was because Jesus was voluntarily and sacrifice, sacrificially willing to be a servant that God exalted him with the ultimate expression of glory. He had been given the highest position that could be given. He has been given a name that supersedes every name. Every tongue will confess that this servant is Lord. This is exaltation greater than any being has had or will have. Why did God do this? The answer is in the first word of verse 9. Therefore, God honored Jesus in this exalted manner because Jesus fully reflected what God intended when he created man. When God created man, he created beings who were other-focused, not self-focused. Jesus fully expressed the highest expression of God's image, voluntary and sacrificial servanthood. This is the highest expression of the image of God. But when you have the two dirty words, <laughs> serve and submit, we have no place for these concepts in our lives. So what is it that's going to define our lives? The modern narcissistic focused on me? Or is it the glorious focus on the glory of Jesus Christ and his being fully man and coming to serve. What's going to be the context in which you define yourself? Jesus fully expressed the highest expression of God's image, voluntary and sacrificial service. God is a servant. Incredible. God is a servant and Jesus modeled that servant. Jonathan Edwards captured this in his sermon, The Excellencies of Christ. He said, infinite highness and infinite condescension. Infinite justice and infinite grace. Infinite glory and lowest humility. Infinite majesty and transcendent meekness. Deepest reverence towards God and equality with God. Infinite worthiness of good and the greatest patience under suffering of evil. An exceeding spirit of obedience with supreme dominion over heaven and earth. Absolute sovereignty and perfect resignation. Self-sufficiency and an entire trust 
and reliance on God. The cross is an affront to the modern virtues of power, pride, and self-fulfillment. What is the modern person? Independent, not dependent on anyone. Self-fulfillment. Pride. A narcissistic, narcissistic focus on oneself. And the cross is an affront to modern concepts of virtue. We see three major manifestations of God's humility. One we see in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where God plants in the midst of the garden this tree. And he says to the first couple, you can eat of all of the trees but this one. And that tree was there to establish the freedom, human freedom. You can choose, you can make real choices, and those choices will affect your life, and they will affect the lives of people around you. You are not a puppet, you're not an automaton. Here, here is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You choose. That's freedom. And it's freedom to say no to God. Amazing. The God of the universe who created us, but he wanted us to be free. He wanted us to love him in freedom, not by coercion. And so he planted this tree in a garden to allow us, to give us a place to show our freedom. We see his humility in the naming of the animals. He gave Adam the authority to name the animals. And whatever Adam named him, them, that would be its name. God made the animals. He knew what they were were what they were for, what they were designed for. He could have named them, but he didn't. You name them, and that's what I will call them. And then we find this third in the phrase, the suitable helper. In Genesis 2.18, it said, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the beasts of the fields. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Because this is before God's manifesting Eve in the flesh. And most of the time when we read this phrase, suitable helper, we bring our context of what it means to be a helper. When you think in your cultural framework of the word helper, what do you think of? Usually someone who is serving you, usually someone who is inferior to you, usually someone who does things that you're not willing to do yourself. That's what a helper is. And we bring that understanding to this word. And we see the woman is the helper. And this is a low thing. The phrase suitable helper, there's two parts to it. The first is the Hebrew word, that means like him, or corresponding to him, or matching him, or counterpart. This is suitable. And this is not an inferior. This is not an interchangeable person. 
an identical one that is the same as, this is an equal counterpart. That is suitable. In Genesis 1, where God said he's going to make us in his image, male and female, and let them rule. This is a suitable male and female, equal and different, suitable, fitting together, one with the other. And the word easer means to assist, one who assists and serves another with what is needed. It's translated help, succor, assist, support, comfort. This word is the Hebrew word easer. It's used 21 times in the Old Testament. Two times it is for the first woman. She is the suitable helper for Adam. Three times it's for those who give aid to the needy. People who are suitable helpers for the needy. They come alongside the needy and care for them. Sixteen times the word easer is used of God. God is the easer. God is our helper. Is this an inferior thing? No. This is God's very nature and character to be our easer. And we find there is submission within the Godhead. Professor Henry Crabadon from Covenant College said this, In the Trinity, the parties are there not for themselves, but for the other in a radical and total manner. We've said in earlier lectures that what binds the Trinity together is love, self-sacrificing love. And here we see this stated a little bit differently, that the Trinity, that the parties are there not for themselves, but for the other in a radical and total manner. Love is the radical focusing on the needs of the other before it's a focus on the self. The unity of the Trinity is expressed in the Greek word agapeo. And John says it in the Gospel, John 17, 24. You loved agapeo. You loved me. When? Before the foundation of the world. Self-sacrificing love existed in the community of the Trinity before the universe was conceived and founded. When did the idea of submission and service begin? It didn't. It didn't begin. It always existed in the community of the Trinity. We think, oh, submission, service, that must be part of the fall. <laughs> no. It did not begin with the fall. It did not begin with creation. It has existed eternally in the character and nature of God. In Mark 10, 31 through 45, we see Jesus unpacking the concept of leadership. Again, Bob Moffat said, God does not command sacrificial service for its own sake. He invites it because it results in the demonstration of his greatest attribute, love. True love always results in the action of sacrificial serving. Loving service heals brokenness. It restores. It redeems. This is God's agenda 
And when it is fulfilled, those who serve are honored and he is glorified. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus announces in chapter 10 that he is going to die. And the disciples come to him and two of them say to him, Jesus, when you enter into your glory, we want to be at your right and left hand. (laughs) He's telling them he is going to die, but there's no place in their mind for him dying. What's in their mind is he is going to be the king. He's going to ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and a sword. He's going to set up a political kingdom and they want power. We want to be at your right and your left hand. We want to be the secretary of state and the secretary of war. We want power. And these are men that have been with Jesus for three years. They have watched his life. They have seen how he treats people, what he teaches, and they still don't understand. They think it's about power. That's where glory is found. And in verse 42, Jesus brings the disciples together because they are arguing over who's going to have the power. And Jesus calls them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. This is the world system. The great person is the one with all this power and authority. That's how the world thinks. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be greatest among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. This is the biblical principle. This is the kingdom pattern to be a servant. And then why? And he answers that. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He could have come to the emperor's house in Rome and demanded the service of everyone in the Roman Empire. No, he didn't come for power, for worldly authority. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is the servant of all. There's two different value systems. The world sees the great man as the one who has the most servants. I want to be the president of the country. I want to be the president of a corporation. I want to be the president of the biggest corporation. I want to have a large church. It's about prestige. It's about power. And the one who is great in the eyes of the world is the one who has the most people under him, serving him but not so among you. This is the way the world is. This is the way the kingdom is. In the kingdom, the great person is the one who serves the most people. That is the sign, the mark of greatness. This was before He went to the cross and it was before the Last Supper, but shortly after he shared this with the disciples, they are at the Last Supper and a fight breaks out between a couple of members of the disciples. And what is the fight over? Who is the greatest? (laughs) And he's just passionately taught them that greatness is defined by service. And they are fighting over who is the highest, the most important, the greatest. 
And what does Jesus do? He strips off his clothes, he wraps a towel around his waist, and he gets a bowl, and he washes the disciples' feet. Why? Because he wanted to personally model what he was talking about. And I'm sure he's going out, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, and this is the last thing he's going to share with his disciples. Guys, get this. I'm not just verbalizing it, I am modeling it for you. I am your Lord. I am your Savior. Savior. And what am I doing? I am washing your feet. Servanthood is not a prerequisite for greatness. It's not something you do so that someday you will be great. No, servanthood is the very standard of greatness. A totally different concept. Serving and leading are not contradictions. They are two sides of the same coin. They define each other. A leader will serve and a servant leads. They are not two things separated by a chasm. They are two sides of the coin. Leadership is defined in the context of service, not in the context of power. Service is defined in the context of leadership, not in some groveling, sniveling position. Just as serving was essential to Christ's identity as God, it is essential to our identity as human beings. The mandate given in Genesis to have dominion is for male and female, not simply male. It's for male and female, servants of the living God, vice-regents of creation. We are to submit to one another as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Both male and female are to function as servant leaders. Why? Because God is easer.